Okay? Listen, you can get hurt by something, but it's your choice to respond to it hatefully. I could stand here right now and tell you the story of what brought me out. I have never pursued a gay life in my life. Never had. I fought it. I, I tried so hard to suppress what I felt inside of me. I pastored as a single man. I went through so many confusions and so many depressions and so much struggle it wasn't even funny to try to do so-called the right thing. I tried to find a woman, I tried to find a girl that I could marry so that that would fix me and I could be right and I could be fixed. I even had a pastor that I served an internship under who he knew, he knew my struggle. He, he knew I was struggling with it. He didn't say it outright, but he said things to me that honestly made it abundantly clear that he knew what I was struggling with. And he would not support me to get my license in the church of God to preach because he saw this issue. He saw that I was struggling with this. I'm not going to tell you how we knew, but I, he told me how we knew. And I went through just constantly this issue in my life. Here it was, not only was Tommy, not only was I fighting against it, suppressing it, going through the depression, going through all the negative crapola that goes on in your own head when you're fighting it, right? But then I got a preacher who won't even help me get a license because of this. So it's like, so an issue that I'm doing everything in my power to do the right thing by is preventing me from advancing even in ministry. So I was just, this thing was just beating me up from every direction. Tried to find a girl that I could marry. Tried to find a girl who could straighten me out and all that. I found a girl. I was evangelizing in Texas. I'm not going to go into all the details. We got married. She and her mother were connected at the apron strings. If her mother said jump, this girl said how high. I'm not kidding. It was... The, the, she was adopted, okay? And the connection between she and her mother was stupid. It, it was insane. I had three offers, three, when I was engaged to her. I had an offer in Houston, Texas, to go down and work in a large church in Houston as an assistant pastor. I had a, an offer in Emory, Texas, which is out in the country a little bit in East Texas, in a church there that had probably about 200 people. And that pastor I had gotten to know, he wanted me, after we married, he wanted me and Stacy to go and be a youth pastor. And I would have loved that. I would have loved to have been a youth pastor. I'd have been happy to have been an assistant pastor. And then I had an offer in Midland, Texas, which is out in West Texas going toward Odessa and, uh, and New Mexico in that direction. I had uh, in oil country. I had an offer to work as an assistant pastor. I had three offers for paying positions. But I knew that if I took Stacy away from her mother, I knew, I said, that girl will be on the first airplane back to Fort Worth to be next to her mother. She's so connected to her mother. I said, there's no way. If I take any one of those offers, I'm going to wind up without a wife. So instead... An opportunity opened up for me and I felt the Lord lay on my heart to open a church in a community not too far from Fort Worth. That way we could stay local, we could stay near her mother and all that. I tried to work secularly. When we first were, when we were engaged, I was working as a salesman for a mobile home company selling 
mobile homes. Turns out the company was fraudulent. I went to work one day, literally, and there wasn't a trailer on the lot. The office trailer wasn't there. These people just literally picked up and moved. And they must have done it during the night. And it must have been a huge operation because they had about eight or ten houses on the property. You know, literally, folks, this happened. I'm telling you, the girl in uh, Birmingham, the first girl we spoke to, she said, Oh, Lord, you got some stories, don't you? I said, Girl, you don't know how much stories. I've, I've been through some life. I've been through some strange things in my life. And so then I took a job at a car lot. Stacy and I married. I took a job at a car dealership. I told the man at the car dealership, I pastor a little church. I have to have Sundays and Wednesdays off. I said, I can work Wednesday, but I only can work till like certain time so I can be at the church in time for Wednesday night meeting. He said, oh, no problem, no problem. Don't worry about it. We can work around that, you know. And I started the job, and I kid you not, folks, the first day on the job, they had a salesman's meeting. This man, the sales manager, calls all the salesmen into office. He said, we're, we're going to have a new schedule. He said, we're working bell to bell uh, four days and blah, blah, and I forget how it worked. But anyway, it would not work for me, let me tell you that. And I think he said, and everybody has to work alternate Sundays or something like that, you know. And so I went to his office afterwards and I said, listen, I said, we talked about this. You know that I'm bivocational, that I pastor a church. I said, I can't work that schedule. And this guy literally looked at me and said to me, well, I guess you've got a choice to make whether you want to make money or you want to work in the church. God called me to preach when I was eight years old. I said, okay, all right, if that's the choice I have to make, I said, well, I'll see you later. I went to my office, the same box I just unpacked, put out pictures, you know how you do in, an office, in a cubicle office, you know, it, uh, or one of them little glass offices, you know. Anyway, put all my stuff back in the box and left. I went home. I told Stacy and her mother what had happened. Her mother got huffy at me. Well, you got a wife to support. You should have kept that job. And, and I looked at her and I said, you got to be kidding me. You knew we were staying with our parents, which was mistake number one through 1,000. <laughs> and I said, you knew when we got married that I was in ministry and that ministry was my primary uh, driver. We were only married a month when this happened, total, okay? And I said, you, you know, you know, long story short, I woke up the next day and Stacy was gone. Her mother had spirited her off. I was told to get out of the house. They didn't want me in the house. I was a no good lazy, no good for nothing so-and-so who wasn't interested in supporting his wife. This is what I went through, people. Now, some of y'all probably agree with them because there's a bunch of hateful people out there. But I'm going to tell you something. I was never so devastated. And struggling with the gay issue, this experience just made it a thousand times worse. Now, they turn around. Do they go and get our marriage annulled? Which they could have done. Because Stacy and I had never consummated. She was terrified of intimacy. So we had never consummated our relationship. She could have gone, gotten that marriage annulled, and at least I could have had an annulment on my record. But you know what she did instead? Literally, this is how this mother was. She was a very devious woman. She decided, well, we want to keep our hooks in him in case he ever makes anything. If he ever becomes anything ever and makes anything. If you're divorced from him, then you can always go back to court and ask for things like alimony and stuff like that. I mean, you wouldn't believe what this woman pulled. So instead of an annulment, we went through a lengthy divorce process. I never 
gave them one minute's opposition. I just let them do whatever they wanted to do. But it still took several months to get it all done. Finally, we were divorced. Now, guess what? Now, there isn't a Pentecostal girl on the planet that'll look at me because I'm divorced. So here I am, a lonely, depressed guy, struggling with being gay, trying my best to find a woman so that I can fix myself, and circumstances are just pushing me further and further away from being able to do that. Long story, I finally meet a girl in Austin, Texas, who is willing to date me, I guess you might say. But I was long distance. So finally I decided I'll go to Austin and I will try to set up a life there. And I'll go to this church, this big huge church that uh, was of my faith. And I said, I'll learn from that pastor. I'll sit under him for a while and learn from him and see how he's able to be so effective in this community and, you know, so on and so forth. And I preached, and it was a mega church. I mean, a mega church, folks. It was a mega church before there were a lot of mega churches. And uh, I preached there thousands of people, biggest church I ever preached in. And then one night, I'm staying at the family's house that, of this girl that I'm interested in. Mom and Dad loved the fire out of me. They, they were trying desperately to get she and I together. But after I went down there, all of a sudden, she started going cold. And Mom and Dad kept saying, oh, hang in there, you know. Uh, her best friend, we think her best friend's a lesbian. And she's trying to talk her out of... Uh, being interested in you and stuff and blah blah well whatever it was something was happening because this girl started getting colder and colder toward me I got a job at a local car dealership selling cars was making good money of course I wasn't pastoring you know so I could do that and one night all of a sudden I'm, I'm in the family room on a pull-out bed and one night there's a knock at the door the man of the house goes to the door he's a Pentecostal preacher by the way he's not pastoring at this time but he's a Pentecostal preacher and uh, he goes to the door and answers the door comes into the family room says uh, Chuck there's some somebody at the door looking for you and I said really I said, well, who on earth would be Look, at the, I couldn't even understand. He said, it's the police. I'm standing there in pajama bottoms and a, and a uh, t-shirt. I said, the police? Well, my first thought was my brother, who was staying with some friends of mine until I could get set up in Austin. I thought, oh my Lord, I hope something didn't happen to my brother or I hope he didn't do something stupid or whatever you know immediately I thought I had to do with my brother so I go to the front door and immediately these guys grab me put your hands behind your back I'm being handcuffed I said what's going on what's going on I don't understand for the life of me what's going on and I'm trying to tell this story as short as I can okay so there's a lot of details I'm not going into I wound up in a jail cell in Austin Texas their their county jail looks like a penitentiary it's huge it's huge if you've never been in jail then you don't know what this experience is like but I'm telling you when I go and visit people in jail and when when our uh, family members of our members and members of our church wind up in jail honey I'm there for them because I know it is one of the most horrific jailers love to treat people like garbage and they think it is their right to treat you as miserably and as terribly they think it is their right to make your incarceration as horrific as they possibly can. It's not enough that people lose their freedom. It's not enough you're sleeping on a cement slab. It's not enough that you're miserable, you're uncomfortable. There's, you know, 
that's not enough. The jailers have to treat. And it doesn't matter if you're there for a bad check or murder. They treat you all exactly the same. One up in jail. Eight days. Why? Simple. Because I tried to call the man who I was staying with and find out uh, if he could maybe help me and he wouldn't take my calls. I didn't know why. I didn't know what was going on. I kept asking, why am I here? Why am I here? Nobody tells me. Now that's against the law. That is against the Constitution. But folks, let me tell you, if you think stuff doesn't go on every day that contradicts the Constitution, you're, you don't understand how this nation works. People pull foolishness all the time. Eight days I'm in the jail trying to call the man I've been, whose family I've been staying with. He won't take my call. Finally, I get him on about the sixth day, I guess. He finally takes my call. And he cussed me every which way from Monday. I was an effing child molesting, effing pervert, effing this, effing that Pentecostal preacher. We found those magazines you had in your work uh, bag. Well, how did they find that? I kept my work bag in the closet in the, you know, where and I had some clothes hung in this closet in the family room there. And, uh, oh, when you got arrested, we decided we better investigate, find out what kind of guy we had, you know, what kind of guy we had to stay in. And foolish me, this girl had been getting colder and colder and colder toward me. And one night, in a really desperate, lonely state of mind, I was driving down the road and I saw an adult bookstore and I went into the adult bookstore. And I bought a magazine. It was not pornography. It was a personals. Back then, we didn't have the internet, you know. And it was a personals, gay personals back then. And I was actually tempted to try to see if maybe I just, because I was ready to just quit trying to do the right thing, because this girl was rejecting me, you know, again. And I was just ready to quit everything. But then I went through, as most of us who have been through that process know, you, you do something stupid and then two days later you're, oh Lord, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you know. And I said, oh Lord, I'm sorry, and I repented, oh God, I'm sorry about that garbage, and help me Lord. I, and I actually had called on a couple of the ads when the people called me back at work. Folks, I'm not kidding you. I was so scared. Because I knew I was on the brink of quote unquote backsliding. You know, I was on the brink of leaving what I knew and doing. And and I had never been with anybody before. And I was shaking like a leaf trying to I'll never forget this one person I was talking to. And I was shaking like a leaf. I was so scared. And I wound up not going to meet them and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, I repented, oh God, I'm going to throw those magazines in the trash at work when I go to work tomorrow. Guess what night that happened on? The night that I got arrested. So finally, this man that I've been staying with, after he cussed me every which way but Monday, he said, well, I don't want you coming around our house. I don't want you around my girls. I don't want you around my wife. He said... Uh, I'm going to give you, the, he said, I've given your information to an attorney friend of mine, and he'll be getting in contact with you, and you can work out paying him, and blah, 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 blah. He said, when you get out of there, I'll come pick you up, and I'll have all your stuff in my car, and I'll take you any blank and where you want to go, but you're not coming near my house. And blah, blah. So, okay, great. So finally, on the week, I've been there a week, this handsome black man, an attorney, came to the jail to see me. And we were talking and I was in tears and I told him everything. I told him about the magazines. I told him everything. You know me. Anybody who knows me knows I'm, you know, 
I'm, I'm a talker and I don't keep secrets. I'm not good at keeping secrets, so I don't even try. I'm an open book. And I told the man everything. And I said, I went and bought these magazines. I said, I was going to throw them in the dumpster, would you believe it, tomorrow. Or the next day after I got arrested. And I said, and lo and behold, that night I got arrested. He said to me, do you know why you're here? I said, no, I have no idea why I'm here. I've asked and asked and they will not tell me. He said, you realize that that is a violation of your civil rights, don't you? That they have not told you. I said, yeah, but what can I do about it? He said, apparently, that little girl who has been, get, had been getting colder and colder toward you, her best friend, uh, hit, her dad, hit, her best friend's dad works for the sheriff's department. And apparently, when they had opportunity and you didn't know it, they had gotten your driver's license number and they ran, they had him run your driver's license number. And they found that there was a warrant out for you. Let me tell you something, folks. You want to talk about an asinine state. Texas is about as asinine as they come. For a bounce check. I had had an accident, hurt myself real bad moving. And I owned a business in East Texas. My little brother had come to live with me. Uh, before he had come to live with me. And uh, he had to call my mother and my stepdad to come uh, take me to the emergency room. And of course, the little town we lived in had no hospital. So they took me to one of those quick health places, you know. And they had to put me on morphine because I was in horrible... I, I'd done something to my neck real bad and I was in so much pain they put me on morphine long story short I wrote them a check for the care because my mother's husband at the time her second husband told me well I hope you got money to pay for this because I'm sure not going to that's what he said and so I wrote them a check well long story short I forgot all about the check I guess that's what happens when you're on morphine forgot all about it. In the meantime, my little brother decided he wanted to come live with me. My mother and I went through hell on wheels because she didn't want him coming to live with me. And I wound up moving up the road about 30 minutes to another town with my brother. And so long, this is how I lost touch, you know. And so I never got the mail. I never knew the check had bounced or else I'd have gone and paid it, you know. And so it was just kind of a series of unfortunate circumstances. I'm in jail for a week over a bad check that was not even for $100. And the attorney tells me, he said, first of all, Charles, he said, I've been an attorney for a lot of years. He said, and I want to tell you something. He said, you know, because I was in tears. I was so upset. <laughs> I was sharing a jail cell with a man that killed two people. And he spoke no English. He was Hispanic. I was terrified. I was so terrified that whole week. I was so scared out of my life like I've never been scared out of my life before. Nobody's going to help me. Everybody's turned their back on me. I've got a Pentecostal preacher cussing me. I've got nowhere to go when I get out. I have no money to work with. I have nothing. I don't know what I'm going to do. This attorney said to me, he said, Charles, I can't get you out tonight because I've got to go in front of a judge. He said, but I'm going to have you out of here tomorrow night. And he said, I am so sorry. You should have been released the same night on a promise to appear. He said, you have no police record. You have no crimes you've ever committed. You should have been released the same night on a promise to appear. But see, this girl's father, who worked for the sheriff's department, was able to arrange it so that I was really put through the ringer over a bounce check.
for less than $100. He said the good news is the state of Texas, when, you, when you're in jail, he said they count so many dollars per day, you know, for, for your being in jail. He said, and by the time you get out, he said, you will have covered that check so you don't even have to pay that check. He said, once you get out of here, your debt is clear so far as the state of Texas is concerned. Finally, I got to jail on the eighth day. The man I'd been staying with came to pick me up. The entire time, he effed me one F-bomb after another, after another, after another, after another, told me what a blanking animal I was, what a pervert I was, what a pig I was, that I was a child molester, that I was this, I was that. Blah, 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 blah. The night I got arrested, I had just gotten paid. Back then, they didn't have a direct deposit. This is back in 89, folks. May of 89, this all happened, or uh, April 89. And uh, I had my paycheck in my wallet. That's all I had was my paycheck. And I might have had, like, maybe, maybe 10 or $12 cash, maybe. I went to a motel because this man was, he said, I'll take wherever you want to go and you can F and blah, 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 blah. Went to a motel, asked the man if he'd be willing to take my check and I'll sign it over to him. It was from a local car dealership, you know. And I said, if, if you'll take it, I said, I'll sign it in however many days or weeks it'll buy me, I'll take it. So I got no cash back. I wound up in a hotel room for a couple of weeks no money to buy food. I went hungry. And I don't mean I got a little hungry. I went hungry. I went days without eating to the point that I literally got to the point I'll never, as long as I live, I'll never forget it, that I shook so bad I couldn't even hold a glass of water to try to drink a glass of water. My body was shaking. I remember just, oh my God, I remember the pain. I remember the struggle of it. It was the most horrifying thing I've ever been through in my life. And that's why to this day, I will not let anybody go hungry around me. There is no way in the world. If I see a homeless person at the restaurant I'm at, I'll ask them, can I buy you a meal? Because I don't care if I have to go into debt to do it. I am not letting anybody go hungry on my watch because nothing is as hideous and as painful and as torturous as hunger. You know, it's one thing when you're fasting because you're, you're doing this having decided you're going to... It's another thing when it's forced on you, okay? Long story short, I'm sorry to take this time, but there's a method to my madness, and I hope you, those of you who are, are extended members will understand. I've been standing here in this city for almost a year and a half, listening to a bunch of whining, childlike babies squeal and whine about how the church hurt them. And that's why they don't want anything to do with God. That's why they don't want to do anything with church. I'm telling my story today for a reason. Because you whining children, you petulant children, you ain't got nothing on me. You ain't got nothing on me. I've got every much as bad or worse a story to tell than you do. The difference is, I grew up. I came to the place in my life where I was willing to weigh my relationship with God and not let the actions of idiots come into the picture. I was never mad at God. I can, I can honestly say, I was never mad at God for anything that happened. No, because the whole time I knew it was the people. Wasn't God doing the crap to me. It was the people doing the stuff. People who call themselves Christians. People who call themselves 
spirit filled okay it was the people hurting me it was the people abandoning me it was the people leaving me to die which I could have done in that hotel room because not one day did I go out in the street and beg I sat in my motel room hungry as all murder wept and cried and prayed and begged God and just went hungry, went hungry, went hungry. Worst experience of my life. And Tommy will tell you, I've talked to him, I don't know how many times about it. Uh, that's what, I'll never let anybody go hungry on my watch. I will never let anybody go hungry on my watch. It is the most... Most people, I guarantee you, have never experienced what I went through when it comes to going hungry for days and days and days. And then finally, I forget how I forget how I hurt. My job wouldn't take me back because I'd been out of work for eight days and hadn't called them. I tried to explain to them what happened. They said, Charles, I'm sorry, you're a fantastic salesman. You make us a lot of money, but our policy is if you don't call in, you're automatically re uh, released. So I had no job. I had no nothing. I mean, I was, I was up a creek so deep you can't even imagine. Finally, somebody told me about food stamps, and I had enough money to get on the bus and go to the food stamp office and I sat in that office and when they brought me into a little room to talk to the counselor man there I was so hungry and I was I oh God almighty I'll never forget it this is like the worst nightmare I've ever lived through in my life I was so hungry that I broke down and went hysterical in that man's office. He was one of the most compassionate men, thank God, that I ever met. And he come around his desk in a hurry and he sat next to me and he literally grabbed me and held me and said, son, we're going to take care of you. Don't worry, we're going to take care of you. I was hysterical. I was so hungry. I hadn't eaten in I don't even know how long. And you're going to tell me some jackass story about how hurt you were by the church because your church asked you to leave because you're queer. Oh, you're kidding me. I'm sorry, Tommy. I'm sick of it. I'm fed up with hearing this crap. I am tired of people who want to act bad using the church's actions as justification for their staying out of church and acting like a dog and living like the devil because that's all they're doing. They're trying to look at God and say, God, the reason I'm living the way I'm living now is because the church did me so bad. And God help them if somebody comes along and says, but you don't have to live like that. God has not rejected you. The church, a church may have rejected you, but God has sent a church that you can be part of and you can be proud of. And you can participate in fully and completely. And nobody here is telling you that to make heaven you somehow have to become something you're not or do something you can't do. I'm tired of all the excuses. I'm tired of all the foolishness. And before I leave this city, I wanted to tell my story so that people can understand. I'm sure a lot of you folks will just dismiss everything I've said, just like you dismissed all the effort I went through to try to create a, a club here for this community, and you just dismissed everything as if nothing I did, none of the money I spent, none of the effort I put in means anything to you. And I'm sure a lot of you same hateful, nasty, rude, obnoxious, 
evil people will sit there and say, well, I don't care about his story. But for those few of you out there who have thought that, well, but brother, you don't know the horrors I went through in order, you know, you don't know the terrible thing I went through uh, and, and why I'm not in church. I just wanted to share my story with you today so you can understand there ain't a story in hell you can tell me that I won't get. There ain't nothing you can tell. If you tell me somebody cussed you and called you F and this and that, and that I believe it. Been there, done it. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. All right. I want to move on with the service today. But I had to share.